And in this segment, we're going to be joined by GMO expert and advocate for safe food, Jeffrey Smith from the Institute for Responsible Technology. Jeffrey Smith is one of our favorite informers of what's going on on the front lines of food and GMOs and biotechnology. And in fact, let me let me bring Jeffrey right on in here with a quick intro. Institute for Responsible Technology, they're a great nonprofit group doing some of the most important work out there. ResponsibleTechnology.org is their website. And uh, every year, by the way, we at Natural News, we actually raise money for this group because they're doing such great work. So we're always happy to have Jeffrey on. Jeffrey, uh, can you hear me? Are you with us? I am with you, Mike. All awesome. the way. Great. Great to have you on. Now, there has been a disturbing development regarding Scott's miracle Grow and a petition with the USDA regarding Kentucky bluegrass, genetically modified yard grass, essentially. Can you give us the breakdown of what that's all about and why it will impact us for the, the foreseeable future? Well, there's two really important things to understand about this latest release of information by the USDA. The first is that they're saying that for technical reasons, they have no choice, no desire to do any regulatory oversight over the release of this Kentucky bluegrass. It's genetically engineered not to die when sprayed with Roundup herbicide, so people will douse it with herbicide in order to kill the weeds. But it doesn't fit into some obscure categories, which has been the USDA's requirements to be involved. It doesn't affect the EPA whatsoever, which looks after certain GM crops, and it doesn't affect the FDA. So in other words, this ruling means that certain genetically engineered crops, maybe most of the future crops that we introduced into the United States that are not food, will have no regulatory agency to look after them. It'll be completely self-regulated by the companies who can decide to put it on the market and not even tell us that it's genetically engineered. I mean, let, let me be clear about this for those listening. This is a huge deal. This is huge. The USDA is essentially saying we have no basis from which to regulate this genetically modified grass and that same logic, if I'm hearing you correctly, Jeff, Jeffrey, that same logic and reasoning could now be used for virtually all, well, maybe not all, but many varieties of genetically modified crops. Is, That's exactly is that correct? Right. You see, the reason why this is the case is that back in 1992, the pro-GM Bush administration wanted to figure out how to get GMOs on the market with as little uh, uh, resistance as possible. So they desperately did not want Congress to pass any new laws. So they they created what they called a regulatory framework, which looked at existing laws, which were not competent to actually evaluate and assess genetically modified crops, but were able to kind of jerry-rig them and to say, ah, here's how we're going to review GM crops using this old law from 1914 and this old law from 1950 and this law, etc. Well, because the laws aren't really designed for genetically modified crops, the USDA required that certain plants have actual pest potential or weed potential potential in order to be regulated. But because they say that this Scott's uh, Kentucky bluegrass has no pest potential and slight weed potential, that they're not even going to look at it. They don't have to approve it. They don't have to do an environmental impact study. They can simply allow Scott to do whatever it wants with its Roundup Ready grass. So then as of right now, Scott's miracle Grow company could begin selling this genetically modified Kentucky bluegrass, and we could have people all over the United States planting genetically modified grass in their own front yards. I mean, this this could be happening now. Not only could it be happening now, although they say it'll be a while before they develop its its marketing. It not only could it happen now, but already there's about 185 million pounds of Roundup being sprayed in the United States. And the USDA just approved Roundup Ready alfalfa, and alfalfa is grown on more than 20 million acres, so that'll dramatically increase the amount of Roundup. And if we have grasses now getting Roundup, what we're going to see is a, is a 
formula for a catastrophe. Roundup has been linked to birth defects, Parkinson's disease, endocrine disruption, lower sperm counts, abnormal sperm, birth defects, etc. And we're seeing a situation now where it's in such high quantities, it's in our food, it's in our water, and it's going to be on the playgrounds where kids are playing soccer and right. where golfers are playing golf. Just so it's clear, again, for those listening, I, I, I almost can't overemphasize this. Based on this decision by the USDA, which is essentially a hands-off decision, we can't regulate it. We don't have any regulatory framework to even deal with this. That's what they're saying. It's a surrender of the USDA to the biotech industry. Because of this, your neighbors could soon begin planting GMO grass all around you and spraying their yards with Roundup just nonstop. Your whole neighborhood, all the playgrounds, all the areas around you could be sprayed with Roundup because of this decision which accumulates over time for months or years and stays in the soil to affect people, animals, and also it increases plant disease. Now, I, I wrote a letter to the USDA spokesperson this morning and got a reply back also this morning. I wanted to try and punch holes in this regulatory framework. I said, let's say you have a GM grass that puts out uh, aromas that cause people to become mellow or complacent or sexually aroused or highly alert or which promote hunger or cravings for a particular company's food or lack of cravings. Would, could that be completely unregulated? The FDA wouldn't necessarily regulate it. The EPA doesn't regulate it. The USDA wouldn't regulate it. So now you have marketers that can come and put in, they can do uh, lawns that attract cats to go to the bathroom on it or lawns that detract, that, that push, repel cats and dogs. They can have cat, uh, grasses that can produce catnip to get cats stoned. In fact, <laughs> years ago, there was a nicotine company, a tobacco company, that grew tobacco with higher levels of addictive nicotine. They smuggled it into Brazil, grew it, then brought it into the United States and put a cigarette in each pack of 20 to create more, more um, addiction in U.S. smokers. It is possible with this law that this would be completely unregulated by the USDA, FDA, or EPA. All right, so now, so now what you're painting here for us is a future of genetically modified lawns where they could have lawns growing drugs or even vaccines. Couldn't you actually have grass growing vaccines in your front yard? And well, if they're technically drugs and they're taken in, then the FDA may have jurisdiction. They might say something right, about yeah. that, huh? But in this case, you know, if it's simply like a plant that has some aroma qualities, you know, you can get different smells from plants. Maybe the smell has some, so is known to be, uh, cause alertness or arousal. You know, it's possible that these can go in with absolutely no regulatory oversight. Like Viagra lawns. Exactly. Yeah, I got my Viagra lawn. Come on over. We're having a block party on our Viagra lawn. And and in the backyard we have Prozac lawn. For the, <laughs> I I think we need to run this by the Oak Park City Planners Office in Michigan to see if they approve of the suitable live plant material of your Viagra lawn. What do you think about that? I think it's a great idea. What we have a situation here is it demonstrates the complete facade. You see, back in 1992, when the Bush administration told the regulatory agencies to promote GMOs, there was only one of them that had real strong um, laws in place that could slow down the promotion. That was the FDA. So what they did is the FDA brought in Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor, to be in charge of policy. And through some kind of sleight of hand, somehow he was able to allow GMOs to go on the market and give them generally recognized as safe status. In other words, he told the companies themselves, we require no safety studies whatsoever. If you determine that your food genetically modified is safe, we believe you. We believe you, Monsanto, who told us that DDT, Agent Orange, and, and um, PCBs were safe. Now, Michael Taylor, was Mon who was in charge of policy, was Monsanto's former attorney, later Monsanto's vice president, and now he was put in as the U.S. food safety czar in the Obama administration. Right, the great revolving door between government and private industry. But, but does all this mean now, Jeffrey, that has the government basically just surrendered to biotech, just thrown in the towel and said, it's forget it. It's not surrender. You see, they're on the same side. That's right. That's you right. See, you see, it's not 
like they're against them and they've given up. They actually, the WikiLeaks have shown us that they've deployed the entire State Department apparatus, which we already knew, but this kind of showed their actual tactics, where, for example, the ambassador to France asked his handlers in the U.S. to issue a retaliation list against countries in Europe that have been uh, resistant to GMOs. That's right. And specifically asked them to cause some pain. Now, we know that when my, I was in Zambia talking to some Jesuit priests there that were, to, that were involved in the Zambian decision to reject genetically modified corn from the United States, they told me that Colin Powell had tried to intervene in the Vatican to try and censure the Jesuit priests, that they, were, they had sent, I talked to one secretary, a former secretary of, or the minister of agriculture there, he said when he was, went to shake Ann Veneman's hand, who was the secretary of agriculture in the U.S., she refused to shake his hand when, he, when she heard that he was from Zambia, who had rejected our GM corn, and just said, backward country, and walked away. Wow. It's, it's incredible. Now, you've been doing a lot of traveling. You spent time in India. Can you give us a, a quick rundown of what you saw there on the streets about the farmers committing suicide after experiencing massive crop failures due to the GMO crops there? What's, what's going on? Well, what turns out, um, an investigative report by a UK Daily Mail estimated in 2008 that 125,000 farmers who planted genetically modified BT cotton committed suicide because their yields were not sufficient to pay back their high interest loans. My friend Vanda Nashiva puts that number now closer to 2 2.5 or 250,000 uh, farmers. And she commissioned a group that actually went door to door to 100 homes where suicides had taken place in a, in a cotton belt and found that about 95 out of the 100 were directly or indirectly related to the failure of BT cotton. And I just, I'm I sorry, just, but isn't the method of suicide usually they drink pesticide? They often do. They often do. It's, it's a tragedy. I just, in fact, read an article this week that um, they, they found an official from Monsanto was visiting a town, so they brought him to an area showing that half of the seeds did not even sprout or germinate, and when he refused to uh, acknowledge any fault, they beat him up. <laughs> really? and previously, other seed salesmen, like a Monsanto salesman, was, was kidnapped and tied up until he was released by the police. You know, the farmers, obviously, they're, they're ruining their lives, they're ruining their communities, and not only that, but I've spo I went to one village where they allowed their buffalo to graze on cotton plants after harvest for eight years, but when they allowed them to graze on GM, genetically modified cotton plants, all 13 buffalo died within a, after a single day's eating. They lost 26 goats and sheep, and this was emblematic and illustrative of what's happening around the cotton belt. Sheep, goats, some cows, and uh, buffalo are dying or having serious diseases or, or disorders after consuming genetically modified BT cotton plants or cottonseed cakes. But Jeffrey, the, the press in the, in the U.S. almost never covers this. Mainline media almost never reports what's going on with the suicides of the farmers, with the dead animals, with the devastating crop yields. We're all told that GMOs increase crop yields, that this is the way to abundance. This is how we're going to feed the world. I mean, how... Why are we all being lied to so consistently? Why can't we break through that with some honest information? I mean, you're doing a great job. Alice Jones is doing a great job. I'm hoping to play my part on natural news as well. We're trying, but we're not, we're not getting to the masses on this. What's, what's it going to take? Well, you know, fortunately, because this is an issue where people can respond to GMOs by not buying them, we don't need to have 51% of Americans reject GM ingredients in order for Kraft Food to say, well, we've lost half of our market share, it's time to switch. When a small percentage of U.S. shoppers were ready to avoid GMOs, like we think about 5% or 15 million Americans, because there's no consumer benefits to GMOs, they either drink poison like herbicides or produce poison like pesticides, then when we see that many people rejecting GM brands, it will drop the market share of the same companies that have already removed GMOs from their European and Japanese lines because there the tipping point has been achieved. We already saw a tipping point against bovine growth hormone in this country where most American uh, dairies, including Walmart, Starbucks, Yoplait, and Dannon, have removed it. So our, our plan is to go to the most receptive groups and to use groups like 
Natural News, which has been fantastic in presenting this information to very receptive people so that people not only understand the dangers, but realize that there's alternatives, which they can buy non-GMO products very easily. And we have non-GMOshoppingguide.com to help people make healthier non-GMO choices and drive the tipping point. Yeah, that's a really good shopping guide. I do recommend that. That's a great That's a great downloadable guide. But doesn't this depend, Jeffrey, on honest labeling? And we have the FDA and the USDA just completely against accurate labeling of foods. They do not want people to know that there are GMOs in their foods. They're fighting this labeling tooth and nail and the biotech industry as well, saying that, oh, if, if, if it's labeled on there, that might confuse people. It might it, people might think it's different. Well, it is different. I mean, doesn't doesn't the, doesn't isn't the labeling the real key issue here?